Well, we want to welcome everyone here. Um, I'm Mrs. Skelly, the science teacher on 6 East. And we're fortunate enough today to have Mr. Lorello speaking to us. Um, we know you guys have just worked very hard on your STEM projects, um, engaging in uh, different investigations that were science related or um, designing new products um, or engineering a new design. So Mr. Lorello is here today to talk to us about careers in engineering. He's going to give you a little background information about himself and his education and I'll let him take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone. So um, just give you a little bit of background on me. I grew up in Brantford, just one town over, and uh, I work at a company called Asa Abloy. It's a Swedish company, uh, and they are ba my office is based in New Haven, and what we work on is door locks. So the doors on the front door of the office, those bars, those are all made right in New Haven. And some of the stuff I work on is kind of the brains that go into those locks so that when you present a ID, it can read it and knows whether or not to open the door for you. So what I'd like to talk about today is kind of how I got started and what is a career in engineering. So first question is what is an engineer? So if we look it up in the dictionary, here's some definitions. Uh, member of military group, military group devoted to engineering work. That doesn't really help us much. Uh, designer builder of engines. That, that kind of makes sense. Uh, person who's trained in or follows a, as a profession, a branch of engineering, once again. It doesn't really help us know what it is. Uh, person who carries through an enterprise by skillful or artful contrivance. Okay, they create stuff. Person who runs or supervises an engine or an apparatus. Now that's the definition I knew growing up. It was the guy that drives a train. Now, a little different from what I do. So the other definition of engineering that I learned <coughs> about and learned that that's what I wanted to do, this is from Wikipedia, is the application of science, economic, social, and practical knowledge in order to invent, design, build, maintain, and improve structures, machines, devices, systems, and materials, and processes. That's a mouthful. In other words, we use science and technology to solve problems and make cool stuff. So some engineering feats. It's the Hoover Dam and the bridge that they built to take traffic off of the dam so it wasn't getting so many cars over it. Uh, it's amazing to think about what went into designing and building that dam, uh, especially since it was done so long ago before a lot of the technology that we have today. Go back a few years behind that, you know, the Pyramids of Giza. Great Wall of China. Uh, if you go drive across the Q Bridge in New Haven, you see, look out to your right, and there's a wind turbine there. That's a, uh, there's a printing company over there. They put up this wind turbine to generate, I think they said about half of the electricity that they consume. Then, of course, there's the Q Bridge itself. That's a case of civil engineering, where they design bridges and roadways. Now, of course, in the case of the Q Bridge, the electrical engineers had to get involved. They wanted to light it up. And then, who likes roller coasters? Lots of engineering work goes into those. And of course, let's go into space when we got our space station. So now we'll bring it a little closer to the stuff that we tend to work with all the time. We have our smartphones, we have motorcycle helmets, motorcycles themselves, cars. Shrink it down real far. That's the vibrator motor inside of a cell phone. Smaller than an M&M. That's what, when you put your phone on silent, that's what gives you that vibration. People lose a limb. We have engineers that can design artificial limbs. That's the kind of stuff I work on. That's an electronic door lock. And then we have technology that can actually be put into the human body. That's a pacemaker. Somebody's heart doesn't beat properly. That'll detect that and give them a little boost to regulate it so they have a normal heartbeat. Who watched the Falcon Heavy launch? 
two out of three ain't bad. They, they landed two of the engines. One of them didn't do so well, but you know what? The other two was beautiful from watching them come down synchronized. This is an example of aerospace engineering, software engineering, electrical engineering, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, just to name a few. Those are all the teams that were involved in making that happen. So what do engineers look like? Well, you're looking at one of them. <laughs> so that was, I was doing some power measurements because we're trying to determine how much, how long the batteries are going to last on the lock. We have to make sure they, they last long enough time so, or else the customers get mad at us. So I was using some pretty cool toys to, to do that. Uh, here's some engineers that are looking at the drivetrain of a car. We have chemical engineers designing new, maybe food additives or things like even the thing about the plastics, the plastics that go into these products. Chemical engineers have to figure out the recipe to make those plastics so they have the right properties. They're strong enough, they're not too brittle. Maybe the color, texture. And you have other engineers that work on things that are a little bit bigger. I was talking about the Q Bridge, buildings. So what do we do? Well, we contain a problem. We have to find the right solution. Is that the right solution to that problem? No. A lot of times, too, we also, not just finding a solution, but we also try to find out why. Why did that concrete crack? We don't want it to happen again. We design things using computer-aided tools. That used to all be done by hand and sketches. Now we're using tools that can allow us to actually virtually put the product together, make sure all the pieces fit. We'll do some prototyping. Yeah, that's a, somebody designed a circuit and they want to test it out, so they kind of use that little, that's called a proto board. They wire it up and make sure it does what they want it to do. We do a lot of planning. When you have a big project, you have a lot of people, a lot of different teams, they all have to coordinate. So what we do is we we do planning meetings. We figure out who's going to do what when. You know, the software engineer can start writing the program, but they may need the actual piece of hardware to test it on. So we have to figure out, all right, well, when, you're gonna, when are you going to have the hardware? So that way they can figure out when they get the next stage of their, their work done. We also have a lot of meetings. A lot of meetings. Usually status meetings, find out how we're doing, how's the project going, is somebody having a problem, do you need anything, do I need anything? So we do, we do that, and we, that's how we move the project along. So you might be asking yourselves, is engineering for me? So I'll tell you a little bit about what got me started. So something I noticed about myself when I was in middle school, in high school, is I like to take things apart. I like to see how they worked. I broke a lot of stuff. A lot of band-aids. Um, I found that math and science were my favorite subjects. I like doing math problems. Uh, I liked science class, especially electricity class, which kind of led to where I am now. Uh, even though, you know, the, the classes there where you do the physics problems there with the, the uh, hot wheels and you have to figure out how high to hold the ramp so that the car actually does the full loop. I like puzzles, jigsaw puzzles, anything. Model cars, I like putting model cars together. My toys were mainly building sets, things that required assembly. So that was probably one of the pivotal toys that I had gotten was this thing called Capsella. It was these clear things that you put together and they had gears and motors inside them. You could do all kinds of different things with them. And then uh, the erector sets, which uh, actually use nuts and bolts and you put put various projects together. In my writing assignments, I usually involve some sort of technology. I wrote about robots, I wrote about anything I could think of. TV shows I like to watch tended to be things like MacGyver or A-Team or Knight Rider where there was some sort of technology or somebody was solving a problem. Now keep in mind, when I was growing up, this is the late 80s, mid to late 80s. So we didn't have the technology that we have today. There were no smartphones. I know, 
You're probably going, oh my god, how did you do that? We went outside, we played. <laughs> my first computer was a Commodore 64. Now this computer probably has less power, processing power, than the locks that I designed today, or even the watch that's on my wrist. But it was a powerful tool for learning. It uh, allowed you to do basic programs. It was a language called BASIC, where you can type commands and it would do things. You print a letter on the screen or make simple decisions. Yeah, I took that apart too. <laughs> so things to think about nowadays. You know, do you like to Google how things work? You know, do you find yourself looking at how a building might be put together? Or why a road is curved the way it is? Even maybe what's inside that smartphone or that television? So what kind of engineer can you be? Well, there's a small list. You know, as you saw like with the Falcon Heavy, you have aerospace, aeronautical. You have agricultural, you deal with farming, how to produce food, how to produce larger amounts of food, better food, how to get more out of the soil. Biological, biomedical. People that worked on those, the artificial arms would be things like biomedical engineers. They learn how to interface technology to a living thing. Chemical engineering. Civil engineering would be like your drainage, your roads, your bridges. Computer software. And excuse me, electrical engineering. Uh, environmental engineering, geological, industrial. Industrial might be how to put together a manufacturing line or work inside of a, a factory. Here's more. Uh, manufacturing engineering, marine, materials, mechanical engineering, building these structures. We had a mechanical engineer who designed this plastic and he had to design it in a way that it could actually be made. There's certain rules you have to follow when you make, plast when you make plastic parts. You can't just, you know, they can't just magically be made. These are actually, this starts out as liquid. It gets pumped into a, a, a cavity. So that plastic has to flow a certain way or else it will create defects. It'll create weak spots. A lot of that goes into, there's a lot that goes into doing things like making a plastic part. The mechanical engineers, that's what they learn how to do. Or they learn how to build the mechanical pieces. Like for example, this is the reader that mounts on the door. There's metal studs on the back. Those actually poke through the door and then the screws go in here. They have to design this in a way so that when you tighten it with the screwdriver, this doesn't rip off. Or that if somebody tries to get a screwdriver back here to pry it off the door, it has to be strong enough to be able to withstand some level of attempted vandalism. And then we have uh, operations. We have mineral and mining, nanotechnology, nuclear, robotics, transportation, and many more. Engineering is a very wide field. There's lots of different opportunities. So what skills? What skills might you need if you wanted to be an engineer? What I found is you need to have an inquisitive mindset. Ask why. Ask why several times. Here's an example. Who knows what that is? What is that? Washington Monument. A while back, they had a problem. The concrete was being eaten away by bird poop. What are they going to do? They got to put traps out. They got to get rid of the birds. They got to put some sort of fancy system out there to keep the birds away. Somebody asked why. Why are the birds there? Well, they're there because there's a lot of food. A lot of spiders are hanging around. Birds eat the spiders. They eat the spiders. They poop on the man monument. Why are the spiders there? Well, spiders have a good food source. There's these like flies that come out. Spiders catch the, set the webs. They catch the flies. Why are the flies there? Well, these flies come out at dusk. They kind of like cloud around. You ever seen that sometimes at dusk? You see these like clouds of flies? Well, they come out at dusk and then they kind of scatter and go away. Flies are attracted to lights. Well, funny. The lights come on at dusk to light up the monument. So you know what the solution was? They changed the timing of the lights. They turn them on a little bit later. So dusk, flies come out, no lights. The flies go elsewhere. Spiders have no food source, they don't build webs. Birds have no food source, they don't hang around. They don't poop on the monument. And it saved us money, the taxpayers, because now we're not, pay we're not paying for lights to be on as long. So 
So think about systems. How do the individual parts work together? Here's another example here. You've got this, we've got this lock, or this part. There's an antenna that goes in there. There's this little button that goes in there. There's the plastic pieces, these spring terminals for the batteries. All these different parts all work together to form a system. What does that system do? Allows you access to the door if you're allowed. Come on. You have a drive to find solutions to problems. Something goes wrong, how can I fix it? Here's an example. How can we automate the process of injecting insulin into the body of a diabetic so they don't need to give themselves a shot every day? Dr. Arnold Kaddish might have asked that question before he developed a backpack size insulin pump in 1963. It's a good sized piece of equipment, but it solved a problem. Now fast forward a few, few decades, more and more engineers worked together. Technology got better, got more powerful, got smaller. And now you have an insulin pump that could fit on the belt buckle and not only detect the insulin levels and pump in the correct amount, but keep track of it and know that if something is trending the wrong way, can alert you and set an alarm. Kind of have a business sense too. It always helps. I, when I got out of college, I took mainly just engineering courses. So I learned how to do the engineering part. But what I learned when I was actually in my job, there's some business side of it as well. You come up with an idea, it's like, oh, we gotta do this. And then the, the marketing people are like, no, we can't do that. And it's like, why? I, I know how to do it. Well, there's a business side of it. You need to learn how the businesses work so, and figure out what it takes to transform that idea from one or more brains into a product, something that you can make and sell. Because in business, that's what they wanna do. They wanna make money. So how do you do that? You make a product that people need, that people want. You know, Apple wanted to figure out how to do digital music. They had this player. It's really cool. It's this digital player. How did you get the music onto it, though? It wasn't really anything out there. You could kind of like download songs. You could figure out, try to find them. You can do this conversion thing and, and get them on there. It was a real pain. And most people didn't really understand how to do it. They developed iTunes. Gave you a one-stop shop. You want a song? Go on there, download, boom. A few clicks, magic, it's in, it's in the player now. Done. So they created a problem by developing this music player, and then they, fixed, they solved that too. And that gave you a one-stop shop. So it, it doesn't just start with one idea. It's one idea it could spawn other ideas and other solutions. So another thing is drafting. I talked about you know the, that picture the engine you saw that was generated by a computer. That used to be done years and years ago by people at drafting tables with pencils, rulers, and protractors. So now we use computer applications. We also do things with a lot of the Microsoft Office or the Google Google Docs. You have your spreadsheets where you take a lot of data, you need to analyze it, do calculations. It's a great place to show that. You can do plots to kind of visualize the data. Doing word processing, writing reports, doing presentations. And these are all ways of conveying the information that we need to, to help convey our ideas and, and work together. Which brings me to communication. You want to have a good communication skill set. And this, is, this isn't just for engineering, this is for any job, anywhere you go, just in life. You want to be able to convey your ideas, both in writing and in speaking. Use good posture, good body language, eye contact. These are all part of communication. And also, have a little bit of sense of history, too. Don't reinvent the wheel. Maybe somebody else has a similar idea that they already did. They already tested it, and it failed. You learn from that. Say, so, okay, well, I know if I go that way, it's probably going to fail. But, hey, if I tweak it a little bit, maybe we can get something that works. So what should you study? You're like, I'm in fifth grade, I'm in sixth grade, I don't know. Uh, okay, well, this is a good place to start. Start with your math. You get into algebra, where you have a variable, you have to solve for that variable. You don't know what it is, so you get other pieces of information to help you get that solution. Geometry, trigonometry, calculus, starts getting in a little, you know, not, and not everyone uses it. I can't tell you the last time I had to use anything from calculus, but that's my particular field, don't need it. 
other fields may have to use it heavily. So you don't know until you get into that, into that you know, further out, you're not sure. So get your foundation now, and that way you, you have it. <coughs> science, you have all your different fields, biology, chemistry, computer science, environmental, physics. Get into a little bit of business, computer applications and typing. You can practice that. I know with everyone having Chromebooks now, you're get, these are things that you know, when I was growing up, we didn't really have that. So you're kind of getting a head start being able to get practice typing and, and, and doing reports on the computer. And drafting in Microsoft Office, mechanics classes, the small engines, electricity, you know, that, that you know, hands-on, get, get, get hands-on and dirty kind of stuff. And if you like it, it's even more enjoyable. So that's all I had. So thank you very much. I'll open up if anyone has any questions. I didn't have an Xbox. <laughs> they didn't exist. <laughs> that the Commodore 64 was probably one of the the biggest things out, and then they had they did develop other things. You had Ataris and things like that. And it wasn't until I would say the Nintendo Game Boy, I think, was like this new, and it was like, wow, it's that big. It was amazing. It was so small, and a little monochrome screen. <laughs> but it was that was it. That was awesome. Best thing I've ever made? Ooh, tough call. Um, I think everything. Everything. It's, I, it's hard to f play favorites. I mean, what, before I worked at Asabaloi, I worked at a company called Pitney Bowes, and we designed mailing machines. So when you got you know, a piece of mail, and so to actually watch the machine kind of come to life for the first time, it was like, that was awesome. That was always a great feeling. It was all done in hardware. They actually designed, they did, the, the first computers were actual hardware, like actual circuit boards. That was what made the decisions. And then they went into things like being able to read like holes in a card and they would feed that in and that became the code. And it wasn't until later that they started getting into actual what you are used to now. Hmm. I kind of like when I took a mechanics class in high school and we got to actually take apart a small engine and then put it back together again. Uh, I know I want to be an engineer, but I'm having trouble deciding what field I want to be in. How did, well, I know, but how do I decide what field I want to be in? <laughs> Probably is going to come into play with experience and observation. So I went to uh, Rensselaer Polytech Institute up in uh, New York. Uh, there's another. Uh, school I almost went to University of New Haven. A lot of times, those you know, the, during those four years, the first two years are kind of your core classes. Everyone's taking the math, the science, things like that, and it's not until kind of your second year that you're going to start specializing. So you have kind of until then to keep an open mind and figure out what you want to do. And some people change. I know a couple of people that started as, excuse me, started as chemical engineering majors and ended up working doing quality, quality analysis and, and some software. So it's open, depends. Do you know like, what subjects you need to learn Pretty much what I listed here. So your maths, your sciences, and then when you start getting higher up, you'll, you'll start to focus on things like, one of the last few classes I took in college was a fundamentals of robotics class or a systems classes that where you actually focus on those particular things. Um, I was good for the most part that I only took things apart that were already broken. Like we had an old alarm clock that wasn't really working well anymore. My mom had already bought a new one. So I took it apart to see how it worked. But yeah, it, I, I didn't want to deal with the consequences of breaking something that was not supposed to be broken. <laughs> Even when I took the Commodore 64 apart, it was because some of the keys were not working anymore, and I had actually read a magazine article on how to fix it. So it was open it up, and you can clean the contacts, and then it, it was working again. So, um, I went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I know it's a mouthful. It's up in uh, Troy, New York, right outside of Albany. It was very cold there. Uh, like, what type of 
Uh, for houses, um, I know on a larger scale, like buildings, you get into architecture, uh, architectural engineering, things like that. Houses is, um, it's more of a specialty, more of like a trade, contractors and construction. But there's a lot of science that goes into it on making the house, you know, designing the house properly. So it's, it, it does take some engineering. Um, there's some commonality between them. Uh, yes, actually, uh, as part of uh, when I was working at Pitney Bowes, we always, when we developed things, uh, if we found that something was what they call novel, that nobody else really had that technology or that way of doing things, uh, they had a pretty good group of lawyers that would investigate it, and if it looked like there was nothing else out there, we'd file patents. Uh, I think I have, through Pitney Bowes, I think I have five patents. I know some guys that were there that had been there for many, many years. Some had over a hundred. So it's there's never a stupid idea. Just remember that. Yeah. Boolean yeah. algebra. Um, not explicitly. A lot of it's kind of built up into, like when you're writing code, but the basic concepts you need to have. Um, just like another example I'll give is, you know, everyone is, has calculators, but you don't want to necessarily just blindly trust it. You want to know that if you get a result, does that result make sense? And, you know, if you're punching in, let's say, 10 different numbers and you're going, 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 and you got your final answer, what if you made a, punched one key wrong early on? That number could be way off. So it's good to have a general feel for, does this make sense? I became an engineer because I liked, from an early age, I liked to take things apart, I liked to put things together, I liked to solve problems, and I think it was kind of the creating things that attracted me to it. Um, a different field of engineering, not so much. I'm, I kind of like electrical. I, I've, I've talked to a couple of my colleagues that do like test engineering where they design the actual, like when, when this product is made, it has to be tested to make sure that it was built correctly and that the software was loaded into this properly. So there's test engineers. And I thought about, you know, eh, it would be cool to kind of do some of that too, the other side of it. So, you know, maybe to that level, yes, I've thought about it a little bit, but for the most part, I'm kind of happy where I am now. I graduated college in, brace yourselves, 1997. So I've just hit my 20 year mark as a full time professional engineer. What's that? What do I make? Right now, I make electronic locks. And uh, before that, I made um, mailing equipment, so a piece that either produced envelopes stuffed with stuff or actually put the, those red marks on them that is basically the equivalent of money, the equivalent of a stamp. So. Um, so the, what's that? <laughs> the expensive, most expensive thing I've broken. Uh, probably one of the prototypes that we had built. <laughs> Uh, we had a little issue with um, one of the motors and it, it drove a little too hard and broke a prototype plastic piece that um, with, you heard of 3D printing? Yeah. So back when I was at Pitney Bowes, there was a, fun, uh, a process called stereolithography where it used a laser to basically harden um, a, a resin, like a plastic material, and it would do it a layer at a time. Uh, these things were very expensive to make. And one of these plastic pieces, probably three or four hundred dollars, and it, it, it snapped. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, you know what? It happens. It, it happens. Accidents happen. The hardest thing I've ever made? Um, actually, honestly, I probably, probably this lock is one of the hardest things because. There's so many rules and regulations because it gets into like life safety. You know, you have to make sure the door stays locked and that the bad people can't get in and that they can't do things to it that would um, allow them to get in. 
Uh, so it's it, there's a lot of rules to follow, and, and also making sure that it has good battery life, and just a lot of lot of a lot of rules and adjustments. What age? I would say once I knew what it was. So it was probably in high school. I knew okay, that's that's a field that applies to me. Ah, uh, probably too many to count. <laughs> yeah, you take some apart and a little spring goes ding! And it's like, okay, I'm not putting that back in. <laughs> um, by taking a screwdriver and popping it apart and then putting it back together. <laughs> I had a problem, I found a solution. <laughs> I think we got time for a couple more questions. Okay, I would say about three more. We're going to wrap it up. Three more questions? Three more questions. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't say you have to absolutely love math, but you have to, don't be afraid of it, and you have to at least have some basic, you want to you have at least some basic capabilities. I'll, it's A lot of it's been made easier with all of the computer programs and computer tools that are out there, um, but I've done my share of algebra and doing like circuit analysis to make sure that uh, things are, are, what I designed, what I planned on, how I planned on having them work will, will work. Oh, uh, that's a true. That's a tricky question. <laughs> we standard is the you know, standard forty-hour week, but we tend to be what we'll, I'll call deliverable based. So if you have a, a deadline, you have to get a prototype done or testing done. If people have to work later or got to come in on the weekend, it happens. You know, it's not a far cry from say medical. You know, my wife was a was a nurse, and if the next person for the shift didn't come in, guess what? She couldn't just go home. She had to wait. So, it depends. Uh, yep. yeah, quite a few. <laughs> uh, one more. Uh, let's see, who haven't I called on yet? How important is teamwork? Teamwork, I would say, is very important. Um, there's very few people that I know that are kind of comfortable in their own little thing, just, you know, doing their own thing. For the most part, we have to work as a team because, as I said, there's so many disciplines of, of engineering, and to make a product, they all have to work together. So definitely, teamwork is important. We're going to end over here. Yep. This last question. Do you use the product you make in your um, I don't use this one just because it's designed for, like, commercial buildings. So, like, you'll find this in schools and colleges, so it wouldn't go. But we do have a line that is for residential locks as well. And I did have one of those on my door so, at one time. So it was, I was testing it. <laughs> so. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. All right, thank you again for coming in. That was incredibly informative and uh, lots of great questions. Great. Thank you. And just, uh, just uh, as you're walking out, that's an example of a computer-aided design. That's a miter saw. This used to all have to be done by hand. Now you can virtually put it together and take it apart and make sure everything fits. So it's amazing how far we've come in just the 20 years that I've been in the field. So once again, thank you, everybody. Thank you.